screen. <laughs> it is, but we've got it. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Dan Walsh. Um, I'm going to be get, doing a talk called Containers in Production. Uh, this is uh, a little background. I run the container team. I'm the uh, lead engineer on the container team at Red Hat. I've um, been working on Docker and containers for the last couple of years. And I put out a paper, it's an internal paper, but eventually we'll be to print it as a blog talking about running containers in production. You know, basically thinking about containers going forward. Um, one of the things, uh, containers talk about DevOps all the time. So developer and operators and how you know, this new DevOps model where we're constantly uh, you know, putting out packages and the whole release cycles and things like that. But to me, at this point, um, Docker is concentrated almost exclusively on the um, on the developer side, okay. Especially when you look at it, it, I'm ignoring orchestration at this point, but just looking at what the tools have done, right? They've been really concentrated on the developer. Uh, when I think about containers in production, I think I'm trying to think, or we're trying to look at from the operator's point of view. What what are operators going to do when they get containers in production? What what do they look for? And so it's what really sort of rethinking about containers. So most container work up to this point is concentrated on the developer. Um, Docker build, Docker commit, right? It's all about building these containers, building your applications. Um, and with standardization of OCI format, new tools can arise. So if we, up till now, everybody's been building containers with Docker, you know, as I said, Docker build and Docker commit. But really, I see there's a standardization of the format, the image format, and I'm starting to see other groups starting to build containers of container images using other tools. And I think that's good. I think it's good to have you know, innovation and stuff looking at how you build containers. So I've seen Ansible right now has playbooks. They allow you to build containers with playbooks. Um, OpenShift has a thing called source to image. Um, and then, you know, they're building container images that. Earlier today, we, there was a talk by Fedora talking about how they're doing layered, layered container builds um, in there, and then there's another project that's been going on for a while called Docker Ram. But the real goal here is to allow people to build build these applications, and as long as the output of these applications is the same, um, I think that's good. I mean, it also means, though, that we don't have to ship a Docker engine and a Docker fully instrumented for building containers in production, right? Um, but really, why do I care about that? Um, what we're looking at here is the copy on write file system. So we look at containers, C container, the whole Docker infrastructure has all been add, uh, looking at adding copy on write because when I'm doing Docker builds and when I'm you know, doing Docker commits, wh what is that? I'm basically taking what I had before, I put a copy on write file system on and then I develop, continue developing the applications and I'll eventually save that application to a, you know, to a new image for me. And that's all built around copy on write. When I'm running containers in, in production though, I don't want my application to be able to modify itself. I really don't want applications to be able to modify slash user. So in, a, in production, I would argue that we want to move towards a state where we're not necessarily using copy on write file systems in general for, for doing that, and that opens up some opportunities. So if we look at the problems with copy on write um, systems, things like device mapper and butter FS, right, uh, both break shared memory. So Right now, if you run device mapper containers, which is the default for Fedora and, and all Red Hat based operating systems, uh, we run with device mapper. The second default is AUFS, um, or o oh, and we're going to talk about overlay FS in a minute, and then you have ButterFS. Well, ButterFS and device mapper break security, um, sharing memory. What happens is these are block based devices, um, and there's a problem that the file system and the block device don't communicate well together. And the bottom line is the kernel figures out that a shared memory is the same. So if I load glibc and another process loads glibc, the, the kernel looks at the file system and makes sure that the file system um, image, I'm simplifying this a lot, and the block device is the same. So it can say, oh, that's already loaded into memory, so I can use it. As soon as I start using device mapper or butterfs, the kernel gets confused. So it can no longer figure out that even though it's using, both, both systems are using the same lower level image, they can't, the kernel can't figure it out, so it ends up loading shared memory. Problem with that is if you ran 10 containers in the system that are loading a JRE into the system, if I ran them on standard file systems, the kernel would figure that out and it would load one JRE into memory. 
the top of a copy on write file system, right now you load 10 of them. So we end up instantaneously using up tons more memory when we're using copy on write file systems. Another copy on write file systems is OverlayFS. And OverlayFS actually doesn't have the, uh, the shared memory problem, but it has other problems. Nice thing is if you've been following the kernel patches, we've been working very hard to fix a fundamental problem with OverlayFS and that's SE Linux. SE Linux support wasn't there. So we lost a lot of security. If you went to an OverlayFS for your back end, um, you had to turn off SE Linux um, support for separation of kernels. Um, my, my team is, has been working heavily on that. We have patches both into the, going into the uh, Linux kernel for OverlayFS and to the Linux security module and Paul Moore is in the back somewhere here, or did he come? He's the one uh, merging into the uh, SE Linux part of it. And those should come probably by the end of the year. I'm hoping to have a raw high kernel out in the next few weeks that people can start to play with uh, OverlayFS and SE Linux support. But a real problem with OverlayFS is it's not a POSIX compliant file system. So there's some fundamental problems that people run into when they use OverlayFS based on assumptions on, on POSIX compliance. Okay, it really would, so, so the, the one we hit originally was a program that opens up a file descriptor and then reopens a, a file descriptor or opens the second file descriptor on the same file. If it opened up the first one for read only and then opens the same file descriptor the second time for read write and it actually ends up with file descriptors to two different files. Okay, because when I open up a file for write, it actually does a copy up, yeah, copies the file into a new place. So RPM did that. And so we ended up with RPM having Two, you know, uh, it's, uh, thinking that it would open the same file uh, twice, but it actually opened up two different files. So th there's, there's other problems, things like uh, sh shared sockets. Um, uh, 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 it, basically, there's problems with OverlayFS. But I think in a lot of cases, people are going to start moving to OverlayFS once it gets a little more uh, support in. So another thing, copy and write file systems sometimes suffer from write. Right? They don't perform as well as XFS. You know, if you're using standard, a standard file system, you're going to get less performance on a copy on write um, when you go to, especially when you go to larger scales. And, um, and as I said earlier, in production, really, you, most images should never be modified, right? I don't expect, when I ship an Apache version, I don't want Apache being able to rewrite Apache, right? You, you just fundamentally, you don't want applications able to write to slash user when they're running in production. So read-only container security is much better for is much better for security. If I can only write to certain directories and I can't write to my executable paths, that's always considered good. Uh, lastly, copy and writes do not support network storage. So you can't run a copy and write file system on top of NFS, on top of Lustre Ceps. Okay, so you lose the ability to share your images, um, so, you know, from a centralized site. You're going to see some cool stuff coming up with that. Each can, so a fundamental problem with um, Docker or a container model right now is, imagine I have a Kubernetes cluster, it has 10 nodes, and also there's a huge spike. Okay? I, always, I always like to use the uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. Right? So the Sports Illustrated gets so many hits per, per week, per week, per week, and all of a sudden the swimsuit edition comes out, and they go like 100,000 times more hits on their website at that point while that site's out. In two weeks, they go roll back. So you need to have this sudden expansion of, of hundreds of servers. If you're running a container environment, you know, what you want Kubernetes to do is suddenly launch, say, 100, 100 new nodes. Well, each one of those nodes, in order to run your application, has to now go out to Docker or some registry and start downloading the images. So it has to install, or you have to pre-provision all this stuff. Right, so just think about that. As you expand out, you have all these images, just image data moving back and forth before the application actually starts to run. If I had a shared file system and I ran the same image on these multiple sites, as soon as the site connected to NFS on the server, your application's there and you're ready to run. So just think about that from a scalability, you know, scaling out. If I could use my images stored on a shared, I mean, on a network storage, it would be awesome. Another thing about shared storage for my images is all of a sudden I have a vulnerability. I have 100,000 installed base. Shell shock happens. Now I have to go out and do 100,000 updates, image updates. If a lot of those machines are all sharing off the same NFS, I just update that image on NFS and instantaneously everybody gets updates. Fine. 
I'm like, so do we want to get rid of cow file systems? Some ways in production we want to, and I have uh, Daniel Reed, who's one of our uh, leads, always comes screaming into me about pet containers. So he calls a pet container is actually a container that you start up and you go into and you start doing DNF updates and you run that container forever, okay? Um, so we can't fully get rid of copy on write file systems, but in, in production, uh, in a lot of cases, I don't think we need to run these applications on top of copy on write file systems. So we've been working with this the atomic registry, atomic or open shift, whatever, it, the, the name goes back and forth all the time, whether we're calling it the atomic registry or the open shift registry. It's basically taking the Docker registry uh, service and adding additional features onto it. Uh, so what, what we've done, what my team's been doing is working on a service uh, which is watching container images to arrive. So when someone does a Docker push to the registry, we have a service that's watching, sitting out there watching for messages coming in and telling us that, um, an image has been pushed, at which point this application will explode the images onto an OS tree. Why are we using OS tree? So we don't have to use up as much space. So you do a Docker push uh, from your server, the application goes out to the registry, this application will watch for that and then will explode it onto an OS tree file system. The first feature we want to add is the ability to do an atomic scan. So what we have is hundreds of developers out there pushing applications to a service we have an application watching it, that, that image comes up, we split, explode it out, we do an atomic scan, figure out whether or not this application has vulnerabilities. If it has vulnerabilities, we can basically deny the push. All right, but basically, in order to do that, we have to explode the image onto disk and then run the scanning on the exploded image. But what happens if we share that exploded image after it's been exploded via NFS, CEPs? Cluster. Let's look at it. Where is my mouse?
digests whatever's in a checksum of an entire image, and images are sort of human readable names. So something like BusyBox might refer to a checksum of an image, which would be located in digest. So digest contains the actual file system, and images just contains this file, a link, which points into that digest folder. So it's a way for us to update the tags, but also keep images around. So like, you can see this, this link contains this checksum, which points to a specific location under the digest folder. Uh, this long check checksum in this rootfs folder contains the actual contents of the BusyBox image. So this is a pretty versatile system. You can do quite a lot once you have access to the rootfs. Um, you, can, you can run scanners on it. You can basically do whatever you want. But one of the more interesting uh, things we can do is share it. So I've got an export configure to just share this with world read only. Um, and I'm going to activate my uh, NFS server so that I can browse this on my host machine and we can see what kinds of things we can do with this system uh, once it's been shared between two machines. So back on my host here, I'm going to mount this uh, at slash mount and uh, need to make sure I can get the address right. Um, doesn't look like it's connecting. Let me check the IP. Uh, it's changed. Fix that really quick. And it uh, looks like it mounted right up. So now I have the I have access to these uh, rootfs folders at slash mount. You can look at them if I do a tree on them. Um, so you can see I have the busy box tag and its rootfs are exploded here as well. Um, so I'm going to configure a quick watch on uh, this tree so that we can take a look at it later. And I'm going to go back into the favorite VM and I'm going to push an image that I've, I've tagged on the OpenShift repo. Uh, specifically, I'm going to push an Alpine Linux image because it's pretty small and uh, it should push very quickly. And so once we push this image up, we should see it's immediately exploded on the host machine, not just in the guest VM. Um, we also now have access to this uh, image anywhere where this shared NFS server is located. So I have actually also prepared a script which will create a container using OverlayFS of any image in slash mount. It's just kind of a hack that I put together. And so if I new start container uh, default busy box and latest, it will just drop me right into a busy box shell, even though I don't have the busy box image on this host. So uh, I can look at the release file. Um, I'm not sure if busy box has one, but you see the point that's uh, it's a <coughs> standard busy box shell, and I can do anything in that shell that I can do in, in a busy box container. It's, it's a run C container running with OCI util utilities. Um, so uh, the hack doesn't really clean up the folder, so I have to clean it up manually, but I can do, uh, I can just create containers uh, instantaneously out of any image that I push to this registry without having to pull them, and I don't necessarily have to use Docker, so there's really no Docker involved in this uh, except in the push. So on any of the clients, I don't need Docker, I just need one C. So I'm going to pull Fedora and then tag Fedora to go onto this registry. And uh, I have to put it in the default namespace uh, so that it has a project that it lives in. Um, and then I'm going to push it. And it'll take a second to push. So while it's pushing, I'm going to explain some of the uh, technology that's going on here. Um, I mentioned earlier the repo folder. Basically, what we're doing is we're pushing these images and exploiting them into an OS tree repository. So OS tree is specifically designed to store immutable file system trees. So it's kind of a natural fit for images, which you would never want to change. You just want to create containers out of them. And the benefit to OS tree is that we can store many different images in the OS tree repo, and it will deduplicate common files. So if two images have the same sort of large JRE or whatever library, it uh, can detect that those are the same object, and it manages them with hard links. So they'll actually get linked against the same uh, file system resource and it won't consume extra space. So if I created a small modification to an image and pushed it, it would not take up any extra space. So it looks like the push worked. And uh, we're going to go over to the host machine and see if we can start it. And uh, it doesn't look like it's, it, it has pushed, but it does take a little bit of time to explode. So let's check up on it by looking at the images directory and looking at the log here in the OpenShift console. And we can see that it seems to have exploded, uh, but it can take a little bit of time to create the, the tag that it uses to resolve names into image checksums. So 
I can look at the link file and I can make sure that the link has been created correctly by just inspecting its contents. And uh, despite the fact that my terminal gets a little messed up here, um, it does seem like the link has been created and if I run the script again, it'll drop me right into a Fedora shell. Um, and I didn't have to do a Docker pull Fedora or anything. There's no Docker involved and I can look at the release and see, yes, this is in fact a Fedora 24. Okay. Obviously, we've got to do a little cutting on the length of this, but uh, you get the, the basic idea. Uh, he sent me this last night, but we basically have the ability at this point to have a Docker registry sitting out there that instantaneously, as soon as any image gets pushed to it, the image would be available via NFS. Uh, and it's not right now we haven't implemented it yet, but there's nothing to prevent you from using Ceph's or, or, or Gluster or anything else. Um, we'd actually like to get to the point where We'd like to get to the point where we can sh share these things even using OS3. So we have, want to be able to support all different protocols, network protocols for accessing your container content and not have to do a Docker pull on every single service and whenever I want to get a container. So that's the first point, system containers. Giuseppe in the corner here has been working on the concept of sy system containers. And what system containers are, uh, on a, first of all, on an atomic host. How many people in here played with atomic host? Okay, a whole bunch of people play with Atomic Code. What's the most aggravating thing about Atomic Code? Yum doesn't work, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't install Vim, you can't install Emacs. So it's real aggravating when you get on there to do it. And really what, what we're trying to do with Atomic Host is we're trying to implement an operating system where all the software has to be installed in the form of container images. Okay? So what we want to do is have software must be installed as container image, but we have a, 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 a catch-22. Kubernetes requires etcd and flannelD to be running before Docker comes up. So we have to have a couple of applications installed in the system in order to use Kubernetes, and those applications are actually going to be used by Docker. So how do, how do I do that? Um, they need to stop before the Docker uh, so it can set up its network, and these containers must, must uh, well, the, those containers can be run on read-only file images, uh, and Docker has problems with container priority. It doesn't have any form of container priority. Now, Docker's talking about putting it in, but up to this point, they haven't had it. But the dirty word that Docker doesn't like, system D, <laughs> has priority, right? You can set up that says Docker relies on etcd, uh, flannel D running, and flannel D relies on etcd being up and running. So I can set up a priority list using unit files to, to set up proper starting of my, my applications but I can't install etcd and flannelD because DNF doesn't work. So I have to install them in the form of containers, but the only thing I get to run containers is Docker, I got catch 22. So we came up with the concept of what we're calling system containers. Um, we're using the atomic command. So the atomic command is sort of the atomic CLI command is the tool we're using to wrap all this functionality um, to build. But the atomic command is how you would um, install, and now you can do it in atomic. Uh, pull in an atomic install, what we call a system container. There's a new tool called Scopio that's got, showed up in Fedora over the last few times. It's actually inside of RHEL and CentOS at this point. Uh, but you can use Scopio now. It's been enhanced to pull images. We're going to talk a little more about Scopio as we get through the presentation. Um, and we use OS Tree since we want to have images stored, but we don't want to use up to this space. We're going to again use OS Tree. And since Atomic Host is based on OS Tree, it kind of works well together. And we want to create a system D unifile because we want to set up this precedent so that you know we can set up a, a precedence order of, of the container side enough. Uh, and then we're going to use run C. Uh, everybody prepared of run C? Okay, run C is a new way. If you were using Docker 1.11, run C is a standardized pod of what's called the open container initiative. It's a standardized default way that you run containers. And Docker actually in 1.11 is using run C underneath the covers to, to run containers. But we're going to use run C directly inside of our system D unifiles. So atomic command has been implemented to handle this. So you can do an atomic pull. Uh, uh, I actually think the API there is wrong. Okay. Uh, anyways, you can do an atomic pull dash dash system uh, etcd and atomic uh, install etcd system etcd. We put out etcd and flannelD containers that can handle this. They're both are available on Docker Hub right now. So you can actually install these on top of uh, Atomic Host. You can install them on a RHEL system or Fedora system. 
um, as well. There's nothing preventing that. Yeah. Wouldn't an atomic, uh, doesn't atomic install do a pull automatically if it doesn't have it on the system? Do you really need to do the separate pull? Um, I don't think you need to. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. You can just do an atomic, to do an atomic yeah, install. Yeah, I think you do an atomic install dash dash system as you need. Sure. Done. So this is this present. This is based on a document that I wrote six months ago. So I probably should. Have. That's why you guys are experimental. <sighs> so so with with uh, system containers now we're using Run C, we're using System D, and we're using OS three for the back backing store. But the container you can't update the container, right? You if, if when a new version of etcd comes out, you have to use a tool like Docker or some other tool to build a new image push it to a registry and then this tool would pull it down, right? So again, it's in production, think about that. You're not developing it, you're using it in production. Another thing that we're adding is what we're calling simple signing. Um, we've been wanting uh, to have the concept of simple signing. What we mean by simple signing is sign signing that is similar to what we use with RPM, where a user is able to go out and sign a document and say, hey, I trust this image. Dan Walsh put this image out and Dan Walsh trusts it. Okay, but then now you get the image in your company and you're working for Acme.inc. And you come out and say, well, we're not necessarily going to trust all images that are signed by Dan Walsh, but we trust that image that was signed by Dan Walsh so that Acme Inc. can come in and sign that image. Um, so we can actually end up with lots and lots of signatures based on the same image. Right? And then the signature can be separate from the image. All it has to be is you have to crypt cryptographically prove that this image was signed by Dan Walsh's public key or by Red Hat's public key or anybody else's public key. So we're adding the concepts to Atomic um, and, and to these tools for simple signing. It allows you to use a PGP type signature, very simple, simple signature to sign it, sign basically the checksum that is appropriate for the um, OCI or Docker image. Multiple peoples can sign the same image. Signatures can be stored um, on this new Atomic OpenShift registry. Um, and, and also we want a lot of signatures to be stored anywhere. If you want to put signatures onto a website and say, um, you know, there's 40,000 Docker images out here, I trust these four. Okay, how do you do that? So what I would want to do is take those four images, get their, their checksums, sign their checksums, and put it on a website somewhere. So now I can do an atomic pull of that application, set up atomic so it goes out to the register to, to my website and says, okay, I just pulled this checksum down. Does it match what you signed? Yep, Dan Walsh trusts it, so we can trust and install on a system, or Acme Inc. trusts it, we can install on our system. Really simple stuff, not, not building up a hierarchy, but just basically allowing people to play with, with signing based on this concept. Then we want to eventually build policy rules engines that say you only allow your applications to run certain applications. So we can build the Docker, and, and some of this is not quite built yet, but we can build an authorization plugin that basically sets up a policy that says, I'm only going to allow my Docker engine to run applications that are signed by Acme.ic. So now if a random user goes and pulls down an application, when that application goes to run, it'll check and see if it's, it's properly signed. If it's not properly signed, then you get it thrown out. Uh, we want to build this tooling all the way up into Kubernetes so Kubernetes can start having policy around this type of thing. Yes? And what about web location? Like, uh, key is yeah, I mean, you could, we, we have that problem, right? You could, you could remove the signature file for it, but yeah, we, we, we always have that problem. We've had that problem with RPM for 30 yeah. years now. Okay. Uh, so I don't want to get, right now we're just trying to get the simple signatures. We can talk about revocation at a later time, but you know, most ways that people have done revocation in the past, we can build that into it, but let's, let's not get bogged down on that. We've been waiting for some kind of simple signing for a long time. Okay, so I don't know how much time. Oh, really good. Plenty left. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about signing, and we talked about a little bit about using the atomic command and the sim uh, containers and being able to run containers on shared, um, copy and write file systems on shared storage. We want to look at a new tool that we're building now. Okay, it's called OCID. Um, and it basically, it's, it's components needed by OpenShift and Kubernetes in order to run containers in production. So we want to look at a simplified daemon, um, but there's four components that we're going to use in an OCID environment 
The first one being container image transport. So we need a way to get that image to the, to the local system, especially if I want to run a copy on write file system. Then I need a way to store it. So once I pulled an image to my machine, I need a way to store that image on disk. The third component we're going to need is we're going to need a way to run the container. Okay, I need a way to actually start a container. And then I need an API, a wrapper around all this application. Okay, so what we're, building, what we're looking at building is this OCID um, spec. Now let's go look a little bit deeper into each one of these. So the first one, the, the way we're going to pull application container image transport, we've already mentioned Scopio in the terms of, of system decontain. So Scopio has gone out and implemented basically the equivalent of Docker pull and Docker push. Okay, it also has full capabilities to do the, the simple signing. Uh, Scopio was originally written as a tool for remote viewing. So Scopio is Greek for remote viewing. Um, just to give you a little background around We've been using Scopio for the last few releases um, for viewing image containers on a registry. And so right now, if you want to look at a particular application, a particular image in JSON using just standard Docker, you have to pull the entire application down in your system and then look at the JSON. What we wanted to do is basically look at the data at the registry and, and without having to pull it. So that's why we originally built Scopio. But after we built the ability to look at the registry, we actually figured out it was easy to, to implement the parts of pulling and pushing using the Docker protocol. So we've added the ability to push and pull images from the registry. And we can pull and, pull, pull and verify simple signatures as well. And we've worked with CoreOS to split this Go, Go library into a separate thing. We've decided to put it out inside of the containers uh, dot images. So uh, basically, instead of putting just Scopio out, which was a uh, CLI, we've broken Scopio into two parts. So now we have a vendor Go language library that we're calling container slash image, and this gives you the ability to pull and push images. The idea is to allow other applications to potentially use um, this library inside of their applications. Not just tie it to Scopio, but allow other applications to use. Um, and there's, since CoreOS is working with us on it, there's potential that they can use it inside of Rocket. So we basically wanted to standardize and rip out one part of the pulling and pushing and put it into a separate application that could be used. And be, you know, just have people work on just that part enhancements. So the second part, now we have the ability to pull and push images from a Docker registry or an Docker registry. Now I need to store it. So after I pull the image, I need to be able to store, the, store it on disk, right? So anybody here play with the Atomic CLI? Okay. When you're playing with Docker images, you always have this problem. I want to look at the content of the image, but I don't want to actually run the container on it. So back several versions of, of Atomic ago, we added the ability to mount an image. So I can take a Docker image and store it in, store it in content and actually mount it at a mount point. So you can do atomic mount, fedora slash mount, and then go to the CD to slash mount, and you'll see the root FS of the fedora image that's installed in the system. The really cool thing is if you're running containers, if you have running a container on your system, you can do an atomic mount dash dash live fedora slash mount. And you can go into the container's mount point, create a content, then go into the container and actually see the content show up. So really, it's, it, we're, we're, we're playing around underneath the covers and allowing you to actually work with the copy and write file system while it's running inside of the container. Um, so we, we did that functionality a while ago. Uh, it works with Device Mapper and OverlayFS, but we wanted to make that more standard. Right? The problem is that the Docker daemon has all its locks, all its handling of its copy and write file system, all of its wrapper of code is built into Docker, and Docker is actually using its lock, it's using a locking system and the locking system's all in memory. Okay, so there's no way for other applications to interact with the file system while Docker is, is working. So we originally started to look at, could we take the graph driver, all the, all the copy and write file systems, move them into a separate tool that Docker and the separate tool could use simultaneously. And we actually found that it was very, very difficult when we started to, to play with that. And we decided to stop doing that and just to pull the, to, pull the tools out and get two of our tools working together using locks on the local file system. And once we have it perfected, we want to go back to Docker at that point and say, hey, we've got all the storage drivers now working independently. So different applications can use the same storage at the same time. Um, as long as they interact properly in the locking system, let's backport this into Docker. So we decided, rather than start with trying to manipulate Docker, and we wanted to prove that we could use it. And it turned out that it's kind of neat that we can be able to use all these copy and write file systems. Um, so 
we call this tool a different in integrations, Graph C, Graph Tool, Calman, um, and Store Tool. So uh, I think right now it's called Store Tool. Uh, so we want to create a Docker Graph Drive code independent library CLI. And we've again worked with CoreOS and we're creating a thing called container storage. And all this is doing is setting up the storage to run images, set up those root FSs on the system. Either using, right now it's just implementing all the copy and write file systems that are currently in Docker, independent of Docker. Um, but I want to add support for OS3 and network storage. So I want that tool to learn if I have an image stored in an NFS, deal with it. If I have an image stored in an OS3, deal with it. Or an image stored in, uh, on, overflow, uh, on a copy and write file system, then it deal with it. Okay? And we can start to look at how we be able to launch containers on different file systems, different backends, based on this tool. And again, it's simple. All this tool does is handle file systems. Okay? Totally independent. The library is totally independent. It can be, people can work on this tool at a separate pace. They don't have to be working with you know, other tools and we can take patches independent of other tools. And CoreOS potentially could use this as a storage backend. Right now CoreOS Rocket just supports overlay FS as the backend. So if they switch to this, they'd be able to get advantage of using all these different file systems back ends. Open container initiative runtime. This is the furthest along of all these tools. Right, so we've got something pushing and pulling, we have something that actually stores the image on desk. The next thing we won't need is the ability to run a container. So op open, the open con uh, container initiative was started about a year and a half or two years ago now. Maybe a year ago, I don't remember exactly when. But basically what's happened is Run C got developed um, based on um, the Open Container Initiative, um, run C in a specification for how you specify which container you want to run, what the applications are, what the labels, things like that. have all been standardized. They're being used by Docker, they're being uh, adopted by Rocket at this point. Uh, other frameworks, other tools are starting to build using, using the specification. Run C is just an initial implementation of the specification. Um, and we're starting to see other people. Play Linux is about to uh, release a mechanism for running containers on virtual machines, um, and they're following the specification. So theoretically, you could swap out Run C with clear, clear containers, you'd be able to run these containers. Um, but they follow the Open Container, uh, open container Initiative specification. Um, and as they go forward, I think we'll see run uh, other systems using it. As of Docker 1.11, it uses Run C as a default backend. So all the software is shared between um, Docker and anybody else that wants to use it. And the OCI tool, uh, so that's all about Run C. One of the problems with using uh, Run C is you have to actually go edit a JSON file. So if you want to configure your config, if you want to configure a container to run, you don't have a simple Docker create command line or a Docker run command line um, to configure your, your JSON. You have to actually go out VI a really complex JSON file to create the specification. That's what Run C uses to actually launch the container. So we implemented a tool called OCI tool, uh, which has actually gotten sucked into the open containers <coughs> under OCI tools. And what that allows you to do is it basically follows pretty closely to the Docker run command line, but you say OCI tools, uh, Docker create command line. Uh, and OCI tools generate, and then dash V, whatever you want to mount in volumes, um, dash dash pid equals host, all those kind of commands. And then it, goes, it just goes out and generates the JSON file that you're going to use for your container. Um, so it makes using run C a lot easier because you can specify on a CLI what you want to run or you can continue to edit the JSON file. Um, OCI tool generates a, a specification then you can launch run C. If you look at, I believe that the system containers that we were using you, earlier, we, you used OCI tools to generate that? Uh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> he, stood, he was smart enough to generate it on his own. But anyways, if you want to play with run C, I would heavily advise you to use OCI tools to, to generate the specification. So the last part of this is the OCI. This is sort of the wrapper around this, this application. And we're actually wrapping this, all these tools together underneath an atomic command, but we want to be able to do it both in atomic command and as a daemon. So OCID is, is sort of the tool that wraps up all this stuff. Um, it's the open, con uh, open container initiative daemon. Uh, I prefer to call it OCD. But, I think it's funny, but anyways. Um, 
This is the least developed part of this, but we decided to develop it. And what this does is Kubernetes, I guess not, okay. uh, Kubernetes has specified ways that Kubernetes can talk to container runtime environments. Okay, so that the uh, Rocket is now using it. I think they still work, talk to Docker the traditional way. But Kubernetes has, has basically said, if you create a daemon that will follow this protocol, then you can set up your kubelet to talk directly to the, that daemon and have it launch containers on its behalf. Um, so OCID is an implementation of that API as specified by, uh, by Google's uh, uh, Kubernetes. Um, and it's a service for launching containers that Kubernetes can talk to. Uh, so when Kubernetes wants to execute a container, it's going to send OCID a message that says, I want to run this container. OCID then is going to go and pull an image using Scopio. So it'll go out and somehow get the image down. If Scopio slash uh, the image tool knows that the thing's available by NFS, it comes right back and says, I already got that image. Or if it's pulled down into its image store, it'll, it'll tell it. But after, if it has to pull the image, it'll pull it. Then OCID stores the image on disk using the storage tool that we talked about. And then finally, it will launch the application we're using run C. Okay, so that's OCID. Um, and it's a standards-based alternative to Docker and Rocket. Okay, so it's a standards-based, but the goal is to make this a fully open source project. Uh, anybody can contribute to it. And we want to, event right now it's underneath containers, but we want to eventually get it into, potentially get it to OCI um, as being a standards-based thing. But again, it's for running containers in production. We're not trying to replace Docker. Okay, we don't want to, the Docker has a whole bunch of functionality. The, the goal of this tool is not to implement Docker build, Docker commit, um, and some of the other features of Docker. All we want is a standard tool that is basically able to do what you want to do when your containers are in production, which is, I want to run this, this application on this machine, so it needs to be able to pull the, pull the application from a service, install it on some kind of file system, and then run the container. That's it, and we want to base it on, right now it's based on Kubernetes. But again, we're implementing the same functionality inside of Atomic. So Atomic will eventually be able to not only run system containers, but you'll be able to do Atomic pull and do dash dash instead of uh, OCI backend. You could say, I'm going to use a device mapper backend, and it'll pull it into your local storage device mapper, not inside of Docker, and you'll be able to launch containers based on that. And eventually we want to get, once we have this up and running, we want to move OpenShift to OCID by default um, and then have it standardized. Another nice thing about this is where Docker is constantly changing, you know, this will give us a little more stable uh, uh, underpinning for running containers because we don't have to constantly swap out um, based on all the innovations of, of building containers and, and different things that Docker is trying to do, and we get a little more stable back end. So we we'll get into questions in a second, but um, containers in production will focus on system containers and system services, and basically Kubernetes running uh, clustered applications. So that's that. That's our goal. And at this point, questions. <laughs> yes. So what is there anything conceptually preventing you from running application containers under the same system? Like, what's the well, we need, we need to, in this system, we need to, uh, by application containers, I guess you're meaning a container? No, I'm, I'm saying, so you're, you're emphasizing the use of this just for the system containers you need to run at CDF Lab or Kubernetes. Right. But let's say I just throw my WordPress container at it. What's well, I would say that's, a, I'd say that's a container in production. The WordPress would be, right? So yeah, yeah. You, what, you're at, what I'm defining as a non-production container is one that's under development. Ah, okay. Okay, okay so if, if you're building a container, if you're experimenting with a container, you're going to probably need a different tool than, than this. This is more about a container image already exists at a registry, and I am putting it into production. Okay. okay? Anybody else? Yes? So hold up. I, I mean... For me, it looks like the OCID has similar features as Container D, except that it will. Really well, Container D doesn't implement anything to do with storage, yeah. pulling and pushing. All Container D does is execute Run C. So yeah, it it, it would be similar functionality. Right? There would be nothing to prevent eventually something like Swarm or, or to take advantage of this tool as well. Now, all we're all we're saying is we believe fundamentally for putting a container into production, you need to be able to get the container installed onto a machine 
load it, and then run it. So that we're adding those three components and then having a daemon that, that, again, the daemon can talk to, uh, to Kubernetes. And we want to allow all three of those packages to develop, th uh, all four of the components to be able to develop it independently. Right? So that we don't have to lock everything into one big monolithic application. Yes? But, so at the beginning you said that Docker is focused on developers, and it seems to me that it is focused on developers so much that it's actually unsuitable to run it in production. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I. I no, don't. No, 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 yeah, no, no, don't put words in my mouth. No, Again, no, no, no problem. No, 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 no. It seems to me that that is what I'm saying. I. I, I you said it. I did it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting into trouble. Yet. No. I, I think. We'll, I think in the future I want to support Docker. I just want. I want to look at it. What, in my opinion, is better ways to run containers in production than, than current Docker workflows. I th again, I think Docker is great for building applications. I think it's great, great for running out, running containers. I just need alternatives. So if you envision for, you know, the foreseeable future of workflow where you continue to do Docker build and Docker run during development, and at some point you do a Docker push to promote it to some production right. application, at which point it goes into the containers in production framework that you've described here. Correct. So Right. I, I think, and I think that now Docker, the Docker becomes one way of building containers. I think other, uh, all, all I really want is I want different components. I want to get back to Legos of, of handling the situation, not have everything be this one monolithic where we're constantly begging people to accept patches because I want some different workflow. If we can separate these out into different components, then you know, I think I think it, the development will get easier, at least for production. Anybody else? Yes. It's maybe a slightly provocative question. We have people like Courtney and Langdon working on minimizing our base image. Is it true that, you know, one of the things, one of the compelling things about using remote storage is that any extraneous bits that aren't actually used during running don't have to get pulled, whereas, as you right. described, you can. So, isn't it true that if, if we get to the platonic ideal of no extraneous bits in the image that you're running, then there's no, that advantage of of shared storage for containers goes away, right? Right, yeah, I mean, if you, if we, if you got back, if you got to the point, and I think you want to have it configurable where the admin can make that decision that, you know, if I, if every time I boot my machine, I have to pull down the 50 gig executable, then it makes more sense to install it locally. If every time I install my application, I'm just launching Apache, and it loads in some CGI scripts, I can take that overhead constantly rather than dra dragging down, you know, the big end. And I get the advantages, of, you know. It, but I, we all make that assumption. One of the nice things about using NFS is I believe in production, almost everybody's going to have the data stored on a shared storage system. Because yeah. if you want to have a large cluster, you have to use shared storage. So you already have NFS set up or Lust or Assess set up. So why are we picking out the executables have to be pre pre installed, <coughs> um, you know, or forcing it to always be pre installed? So we need to take advantage of the tools that, you know, people have been using NFS for 30 years for a good reason. And I showed NetApp would like, like this part. <laughs> Are you a shill for NetApp? Yeah. One minute. Yeah, one minute. Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to take it. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take it. Any comments about the presentation? I'd like to hear about them. Um, as I said, we're going <coughs> expanding as we go forward and we're going to cut down on the amount of time um, that's shown. And hopefully, the next time I do this, I'll be able to show the entire OCID. So, thank you for coming.